In the past few days, there have been conflicting headlines. One lot talk about Japan warning it will start buying gas from potentially Alaska as it sees Australia as an increasingly costly and unreliable supplier. The Korea has made similar noises in the past. On the other hand, the government is about to release its code of conduct for the local industry designed to ensure there's plenty of gas in our system. So which view is right? Andrew Richards is the Chief Executive of the Energy Users Association of Australia. His members are the biggest gas and electricity users in the land and joins me now. Andrew, always good to chat to you. I mean, you've got to sort of separate these things, but they do come together in terms of the incentive for people to invest tens of billions of dollars into future gas projects here, don't they? Yeah, g'day, Ross. Thanks for having me on the show. You're right. There's a number of issues here, one of which is the uh, soon-to-be-released gas industry code of conduct. The other issue that we've been hearing about is concerns around the revised safeguard mechanism, of which uh, our members will have to comply with, and so too will gas producers, and that's meant to, over time, reduce overall emissions in the economy. So I'd point out when, when people like our, our trading partners like Japan, who are also a signatory to the Paris um, Agreement, um, they also have a net zero target. They are also committed to reducing emissions. So this is where, I guess, the rubber hits the road on emissions reduction when we're talking about the safeguard mechanism. It's, it's one thing to talk about it. It's then very, very difficult to make it happen. So everyone's committed to doing that, and there's clearly going to be some hurdles, in this case for the gas industry, as there will be some hurdles for large gas users as well. I, the I, no, just, uh, I was going to jump in there because just to explain to people, this is really about the future gas projects will have to be able to prove themselves to be net zero as soon as they get underway. So that's a key. And especially with methane emissions being a big issue for many of those gas projects, that's a key for them to try and work out how they can achieve that even before they get the go ahead. It, it, that's right. And that, that goes to environmental approvals as well, Ross. So in many, in many ways, the longer term issue for the gas industry is meeting those emission reduction objectives. But again, if our major trading partners also have those objectives in place, then clearly um, there's going to be a role for, for lower cost and lower emissions energy going forward. And the role that gas plays in that is going to be, I guess it's still um, something for debate, uh, not only internationally, but also here in Australia. Now, that's sort of happening at the same time as the, the federal government, rightfully in our view, has bringing in a mandatory code of conduct for the gas industry. And, you know, the gas industry has been complaining about it, but quite frankly, Ross, they're right up there with the English cricket team in complaining about self-inflicted wounds. Um, we hope that once the, the code is out and it's understood uh, that the deal flow starts happening again, and we're seeing some green shoots of that already, which is pleasing, and then we just get on with making sure that domestic gas users can get access to gas at a fair and reasonable price. And that's the whole idea. That should not disrupt our international trade in any way, shape or form. And I know the federal government's been really keen on this to make sure that everyone is able to survive this and get through uh, and, and, and continue to be profitable. Yeah, my mail is that, of course, that this gas code, whatever it is, might be handed down as soon as Monday. But the real thing here is with the $12 per gigajoule cap on the prices, that's who's exempted from that. And that yeah. seems to be the big guessing game as to where those exemptions are going to go. And, and indeed, that could determine some of the near-term projects as to whether they go ahead or not. Well, that's, that's right, Ross. That's the sort of the devil in the detail that we need to look at with when the code is finally released. There is an exemption framework, and that's predominantly um, about getting smaller plays into the market. So a lot of smaller gas producers will be automatically exempt, um, provided they are providing gas to the domestic market. And we're starting to see some of those longer-term deals occur, and we hopefully we'll see more of those. So that's a good thing for competition, getting more people selling gas in Australia. Then there's the, the big three, I guess, the three LNG um, exporters. They can apply for exemptions from the pricing provisions of the code, provided they can stay guaranteed to sell gas domestically. So in many ways, it's going to be a roundabout way of creating a domestic gas reservation without without actually creating the reservation. So hopefully in the, in the medium term, what this will drive is a far more competitive domestic market and hopefully consumers, domestic consumers, will benefit from that. And that will separate domestic prices in particular, which is part of the goal, from the volatility of international markets that we've been seeing you know, quite dramatically over the last 12 to 18 months. 
and there's a bit of irony here because we put it up before, but we'll put it up again and show the actual spot price of LNG in recent times. Now, by complete irony, the LNG price has fallen from its peaks about $70 uh, per gigajoule, has fallen back to around $12 per gigajoule, which is pretty much where the price gap set by the Australian market already is. Yeah, we've got to be really careful when you look at spot prices, particularly Australian spot prices, Ross, because they're very thinly traded. And I'm not aware of any long-term contract that's based on a domestic spot price. What they're looking more towards is the ACCC's LNG net back pricing, which is still sitting at about $20. So it's, it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, their spot prices have come down, but no one's really trading in that space. It's what we look at with the contract volumes and the contract pricing. That's what really drives value or destruction of Australian manufacturing. So we'll be watching that very closely as to what happens with contracts. And I think what we've seen pre, uh, recently, um, Cenex have been out there signing up some conditional deals. We understand, and they're exempt from the from the pricing provisions of the code. Um, we understand those prices at around twelve dollars. So that would be a, a good outcome for those people in, involved in those deals. Yeah, Andrew Richards, always good to chat to you. Many thanks for your time. We'll know more about that code probably as soon as next week. Uh, it's like it's like waiting for Christmas that never comes, isn't it, Ross? There you go, Andrew. Thank you so much.